Welcome <clears> back. <throat> I'm Kim Bailey. She's Fuliana Osborne, and this is Inside Exec. This week, we are joined by Paul Quatracasas from London, and Paul's going to talk, amongst other things, about his new book, but particularly about disrupting industry and disrupting it with IT. Thank you for joining us, Paul. I know it's early morning for you, but we do appreciate it. Thank you, Kim. Glad to be here. Let's start out with the first question that we sent you to think about. Do you see that there is more threat in service industries or product industries? Yes, at the moment, the disruption, the threat is happening uh, across all industries, services and product. However, we have already seen significant threat over the last 20 years in photography, in newspapers, in broadcasting. And most of that to date has been in what's become digital industries or more services industries. What we're starting to see, of course, now is industry 4.0. And we're seeing robotics and 3D printing, AI, machine learning applied to the product industry or manufacturing with incredible pace and speed. It's not so fast yet that companies can't keep up in terms of manufacturing products and selling them like they normally do, but it is is starting to have uh, a real impact. So, you know, it's an interesting question. I would have to go into the individual industries But we just took one, which is one I often talk quite a lot about because it can seem obvious to some people if they uh, they think about it as food. So food is a a product rather than a service, although there are many services attached to food. What we're seeing in the food industry now is a disruption of every part of the value chain within the food ecosystem from the farm all the way to the fork. So in terms of the farm disruption, we're seeing beyond meat and possible food, so plant-based meat plant-based proteins. We're going to see that continue into plant-based fish and lab fish, we call aquaculture and also lab meat, where there are many, many companies raising raising capital to offer those products in the next few years. And so we're going to have a world 10 years from now, earlier than that, five, six years from now, in which more and more of the meat and food that we eat is not grown in the farm or doesn't come from animals that we have to breed and feed and kill and then transport for our food. It's going to come from a lab. That's a game changer. It's like going from the horse and cart to the yeah. to the automobile. And then along the way from getting that food into the, the home or into uh, people's mouths effectively, there are all types of new ways of delivering that food or getting that food to someone. And we've seen some of that in pandemic with more food delivery, even meal kits, having cloud kitchens now emerge. The transportation will move from humans that drive vans with petrol or diesel to self-driven vans that are electric and also to drones, which we will see. It's not going to happen overnight, but the convenience will increase to the point where, you know, I think in the not too distant future, perhaps up to half the people will start to order food rather than cook it themselves Mm -hmm. because it'll end up being cheaper, easier, tastes better, and and frankly, uh, a lot more convenient. Just in terms of that, we're talking about industry and all of these innovations that are happening. Is there then a bottleneck with legislation? Not necessarily. So on things like drones, they have been approved in the US. They've had FAA approval. Amazon Air just got approval a few months ago. So that's starting to happen. On the food front, it's the FDA in the US. And that often tends to set the standard for other parts of the world in terms of getting uh, approval. The FDA has approved or is close to approving, I should say, one of the the lab food companies. It might take a bit longer with a few of the others, but it's going to happen. It's just like anything else with the science. If you give it enough time and you give it the right minds and enough money, they'll find a way. And none of this is uh, is necessarily uh, having to break the law of physics. It's something that is doable. It just takes takes time. So regulatory approval is often a barrier in many of these cases, but it's just a matter of time. I mean, I remember in the early days of SpaceX, in fact, I was working on a deal where we had to go visit SpaceX in Washington, D.C. It's over 10 years ago. They had not yet launched a rocket. There was a long process for them to get approval from the Civil Aviation Authority, I think is where it started, all the way through to whatever pools you need to, to launch rockets in space and look at them today. Just a matter of time, dedication, perseverance, focus, just like you'd have with any entrepreneurial company, and you get there in the end. 
You talked about the food. So what we're eating is going to be different and mm -hmm. produced differently. And you ordered, what did you call the cloud thing? Lab meat and fish aquaculture. Some people will also say cellular fish. Right. And what about, you said something about we order through the cloud. I guess you could call these cloud kitchens or right. ghost kitchens. They're right. just emerging now. In fact, our firm produces a, a monthly intelligence briefing and, and next month is going to be on cloud kitchens. And so, yeah, these are kind of started, it didn't start with a pandemic. It's accelerated with a pandemic, but yeah. restaurants can use their kitchen or grow the size of their kitchen, including yeah. insourcing cooks to cook meals for either other restaurants that are shutting down or for mm -hmm. other brands or create an own brand. There's some really interesting models out there. There's one in Malaysia called Damakan, uh, you know, that's raised significant venture capital money now. And they are really doing some interesting things. They are uh, using their own brand. They have all kinds of recipes. I mean, I don't know how many, but probably a thousand different recipes. And it's, it's high quality food. It tastes good. Yeah. They've located their kitchens strategically close to population areas so that you can get the food to the house or flat or whatever that's ordered it within 10 or 15 minutes. And they're able to do that at a lower cost than going to the restaurant. So we're just already seeing a lot of very interesting models emerge. And it's all ordered through your mobile phone. It sounds awesome. And for me, it sounds too futuristic, but you're saying it's not so far-fetched. It's yeah. happening. That's happening right now. Right. Do you see then going to a restaurant to enjoy a meal, is that changing? Or is that going to be less off or different? Yeah, I don't think that will ever change because right. we're human. As long as we stay okay. human, we're social, yeah. we'll always want to do that. I mm -hmm. mean, eating pretty fundamental to the human being. And what I do think is we'll have a little bit more entertainment in, right. in restaurants. I also think we'll have a little bit more entertainment required in stores and going shopping, especially grocery shopping. Right. Because there'll be more and more ways of, if not having the groceries delivered to us that we want, and that's going to be a very interesting area. But we'll even have ways of meals being prepared, preparing our own meals very easily. So that yes. that's going to change. So the question is, why would you go into a, to a grocery store? Yes. Um, I haven't mentioned virtual reality shopping, which it exists today, but it's it's early days. Once we have 5G on a massive scale, we're going to see virtual reality shopping, I believe, take off. Because we don't need these big, heavy glasses, but we can essentially, instead of just having the two-dimensional online shopping now, but we're clicking the things we want, we put into a basket, we can put on our hopefully very thin glasses, maybe one day soon, who knows, even be contact lenses. And we go on to the virtual grocery store right. and we have an experience. Right. We can see friends, we can see yes. celebrities, musicians doing acts as we're picking up our, mm -hmm. you know, our Diet Coke, our milk, our bread. We can throw it into the basket. We can throw it 30 feet and see if we make it in or not. Have fun with it and check that basket out just like we do today, but with a, a virtual experience. And I think that's going to become good enough that people just won't feel the need to go at all. Not very frequently. And the other development in, in grocery shopping is checkout, automatic checkout. Yeah. We've seen that with Amazon Go, yes. which is really rolling that out in the U.S. There's also checkout technologies or you know, other companies that are offering this. There's just a lot of changes, but the restaurant experience itself, I don't think it's going to go away. No. Sounds very exciting, actually. Well, I think it is. Think. We'll send you to Dubai where you can go to the restaurant that is all automated and they just, the little robot comes in and serves you the coffee. Oh, yeah. There are already quite a few robots. Uh, you have yeah. quite a few of those in China and Japan where you walk into yeah. restaurants and you're served by robots. In terms of those industries, so we're seeing industries that are under threat from that uh, interruption, that disruption. Are there industries that are going to benefit? Yes, I think ultimately most industries will benefit, but for companies to benefit within that industry, they're going to have to become fully technology enabled, if not become technology companies themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, I read an article recently, someone claiming that all companies will have to become fintech, financial technology companies, simply because yeah. the way that their customers are paying, making payments and using funds is all done through some technology-enabled platform. I think that's a little bit far-fetched. But the point is that, that every industry every industry is being disrupted because it's all an ecosystem. I mean, if, again, if we go back to the horse and car going to the automobile, it changed an entire ecosystem that had been built around the horse and car for, I don't know, a couple of hundred years. Yeah. And then within 25 years, the market share of the horse and cart went from 95% to 5%, completely replaced by the automobile. And the automobile created an entire new 
ecosystem yeah. of component suppliers and you know all the uh, the steel companies and the tire companies and wheels and I mean you name it and the GDP factor or the size of the industry I forget the exact numbers but it's something like the 1899 the horse and cart market was 150 million dollars but by 19 19- 25, the automotive market was several billion. And so that is the kind of thing that can happen is that the overall GDP level increases because of this new thing. I mean, if we look at the introduction of smartphone, I mean, the, these developments are very deflationary. I haven't run the numbers, but I watched the most recent Apple launch of the iPhone, iPhone 12, 5G, which has LiDAR scanning and augmented reality. I mean, it's it's really quite amazing. I think most people will will see how amazing it is once once mm. they have one in a few weeks. But the technology in that iPhone 12 Pro, yeah. if we wind the clock back to, I don't know, 1990 or 1985, would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars, if not millions of dollars. And you can have one of those in your pocket for, you know, $1,500. It's quite amazing. And so this is the deflationary effect of technology at the same time if we think about the deflationary effect of the smartphone, it's created new industries, right? It's, cre- it's helped create Uber, for example, which has got okay. a market cap of around 50 or 60 billion. It's created Airbnb. These aren't just apps. These mm. are ecosystems. Mm. And then when you think about something like Uber, one of the reasons why investors are intrigued by Uber long-term mm. is that there's not an expectation that the model will stay as it is for another 20 years. There is an expectation that those automobiles will become more efficient. They'll be electric and they won't be driven by humans. They'll be auto driven. And so the business model uh, of Uber, which, you know, it's a big factor is the human driver that goes away. And so literally all you have is a software platform that is orchestrating self-driven, self-driving electric vehicles that are transporting Mm -hmm. people and goods and food, by the way, with Uber Eats. So it's all change. You know, every industry has to become a technology industry. It already, it already is. When you've gone into big corporations to help them become more profitable and to keep them away from being extinct, as you say in your book, have you come across where there's some resistance in some corners of the executive team? And how did you deal with that? <laughs> Oh, Fulyana, how are you asking that question? Resistance, <laughs> please. We never see that. Some people, you know, would think, oh, you know, that's all sound good in theory, but can't work here. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I'm laughing because we see it in nine times out of 10, if not 95 times out of 100. There's always resistance. I can't think yeah. of it. I'm struggling to think of a case out of the 350, 400 companies, you know, we've been dealing with yeah. in one way or another where there has not been resistance. Right. There's resistance right. everywhere. There's a natural immune system. <laughs> Typically, you'll find it in middle management that rejects anything yeah. new, even if it's technology or not. They'll reject new people, new yes. ideas, yes. software. So that's the nature of the beast. And yeah. I think, actually, you've hit the nail on the head. That is the greatest challenge that mm-hmm. companies have. How do they manage the speed, right? It's not so much the change. Mm-hmm. We've always had change, but it's the pace of change. One of the more interesting developments that I don't think I expected when we started this journey of advising large non-tech corporates on how to avoid being disrupted out of existence yes. and also how to accelerate their own market position. I didn't expect to see the impact on talent. Mm-hmm. So the result of companies not being able to adapt to the new accelerating digital world is that they will lose or they're at risk of losing some of their best people who do see and they're very aware. These are very smart, capable, talented people. They see what's going on. They read the news. They have friends, uh, contacts. They're, they're frankly talking with a lot of the tech companies about commercial partnerships or as a customer, right? And, and these tech companies could be a supplier. So they know. They know what's going on. And they're increasingly getting calls from recruiters and, and others to either join a big tech company, excuse me, or join a unicorn or even a smaller VC-backed company in which they can earn options and warrants and be part of a growth story. They're being coaxed away. They're also in some cases being coaxed away by competitors who are committed to this path and are taking risk. And that to me is possibly the greatest threat of all for these large companies, because as we accelerate into this new world, we don't need more people or bodies, as I put them, we have this measure we've created called body value. We don't need more people 
to grow, but we need people who are better fit and who are designed into our, our new, you know, the, the company that we're growing into over the next five or 10 years, and who can also design our offering, our platform, our system, our value chain that, that uses fewer humans. So it, the people are becoming more and more important because they're designing a company that has fewer people. And yeah. if we lose those people, then we're really challenged just because we, we don't have that, that same capability. But by losing those people, we're also struggling to recruit the new talent that we need to recruit who have the skills and yeah. the experience that we need. And I really think it's one of the greatest threats because once a company starts losing that talent or that talent be, maybe is not lost, but they just hang out. You know, yeah. they're just, they're, they're, they become unmotivated. And if, yeah. if they feel like their ideas are not being accepted and they're not being listened to, mm-hmm. and they're a victim of the immune system themselves, mm-hmm. then it's almost the same effect, if not worse, frankly, if, than leaving. Yeah. And it has a, a real impact on these companies being able to recruit the talent they need. So I, you know, people don't often talk much about that when they talk about digital transformation uh, yeah. and disruption and technology but it's all about the people. I mean, tech companies are people companies. I mean, they're they're mainly coding software yeah. and they are they're designing chips and those chips are systems. They're systems on a chip and those chips are designed with software and integrated and it's all people. It's not about the actual product of oil or gas or timber or metals or hardcore products. Not that any of those things aren't important. It's just that when it comes to technology, yeah. it's all about the people. And yeah. it's not about even the, the product they're developing because the people can very quickly adjust that product, mm-hmm. pivot as we say, yeah. to address the right market and the right, uh, the right customers. If it's all about people and you're, you're either losing people or they're not excited by what you, the company are doing, then it's, it's really a problem. And it's uh, so it's that should be a big incentive for the resistors to know they're going to be worse off by resisting rather than looking after themselves and moving forward faster than others even. Yeah. Look, the good news is many companies have these executives who really believe in what the company can achieve. And so they often tend to be cheerleaders yeah. and influencers and leaders, and they'll often take bold risks mm-hmm. and they'll often stand up and be the champion. Uh, mm-hmm. And those tend to be our clients. You know, we have uh, clients with, with they boil down to people who see it. Yeah, they want to be a company that does well, and they're able to persuade their colleagues in an empirical way. You know, using facts and using evidence and case studies, and that works. It doesn't always work, but it often does. And uh, and thanks that those people are are around. Sometimes, sometimes they make it. You know, sometimes they're rejected, and and that's the risk they take. That's the nature of business: is taking risk. So we, we try to help those executives, the ones who, who really do want to make an impact and they want to bring on board their colleagues. Uh, it typically happens at the executive committee level and then moves down a level from there. But we help them in any way we can to bring evidence and, and we focus on the impact uh, mm-hmm. on the things that matter. Yeah. And the things that matter to these companies, of course, are revenue growth, market share, Yes. Ability to launch new products or enhance the customer experience, increasing mm-hmm. pricing, uh, increasing gross margins. How can we reduce the cost of sale, make, you know, make things more efficient? How can we do it with fewer people? Those things are important. And I call them more optimization and oh. efficiencies rather than transformation. But you have to start somewhere. I don't yes. think you can start yes. off with transformation because it yes. doesn't mean a lot to, to people. You, know, you have to start with some baby steps sometimes. That's where we'll take a break in this very fascinating discussion with Paul Quattrocasas. Join us for part two. For now, I'm Kim Bailey. She's Fuyan Rosborn, and this is Inside Exec. 